Thank you, Sharon, for that medley of songs. Beautiful. It's uh, one I haven't heard in a long time. So good to see everyone on this hot July day. And it's going to get hotter, I hear, you know, in the latter part of the week. We uh, do have a family. It's uh, Sam and uh, Gabrielle Hicks. They have a new baby girl. They already have one little girl, and now they have two. And uh, it was born, she was born last night at uh, 10.23 p.m. Uh, weighed uh, 6 pounds and 15 ounces. And they named her Holland Marie. And so we knew Sunday it wouldn't be long. You could just, yeah, I've been around long enough to know when it, when it looks like it's going to happen soon. And, and I think the baby had sort of dropped. And, and, they, and she was ready. And, and so they're excited. They said something about seeing a Sunday. And I, I don't know about that. But uh, I, uh, my parents used to at least wait two weeks before they brought me to church. Well, tonight we come to a rather short chapter. We come to Psalm chapter 52, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 9, and we're going to study God's righteous judgment on a wicked man. And we know who this wicked man was because uh, it is given uh, right here at the beginning of the psalm. Our psalm this evening is most unusual in one key way, and that is that it doesn't address God. Uh, rather than addressing God, the psalm is addressed to this evil man. Uh, David is writing to this evil man, and he serves as a warning to a wicked person regarding the wicked life and future that he might expect. At the same time, it is written from the perspective of a righteous man who suffers because of the actions of this wicked man. David rebukes his enemy, and he foretells his downfall in this chapter in the book of Psalm. This psalm refers to the episode between Doeg and David. And you, you may not initially remember the details, but uh, we studied through First and Second Samuel. And when we were in First Samuel, chapters 21 and 22, we covered these chapters last year uh, when we went through uh, first Samuel. And so these chapters record a time when David had to flee from King Saul. He was running for his life, and Saul, out of jealousy, was determined to kill David. And as he fled, he st David stopped by Nob, which uh, it, it was known as the place where the priest lived. And he asked Ahimelech for supplies for his men because several thousand men had joined him, and so he needed, he needed some supplies. And uh, the, the uh, chapters record how there was a man that saw it go down. And the man was Doeg. He was not an Israelite. He was an Edomite from Esau. And, and he saw David there, and he went back and reported it to jealous King Saul. And so Saul had Doeg kill the priest and then had him kill every man, woman, child in Nob because David had uh, received help from the priest, Ahimelech. And so this is just unthinkable evil. This is just senseless, the senseless slaughter. In all, it was, the Bible says it was 85 priests who wore the ephod along with their wives and their children, and, and uh, by wicked Doeg, the Edomite, he killed them all. And so uh, one, one escaped to tell David. And so the killing spree did not end there, but it included the whole town of Nob, uh, men, women, and children, cattle, donkeys, and even sheep. Killed, killed everything. And so all this happened merely for unbridled selfish advancement and the heading of uh, psalm 52 you'll notice indicates that this historic evil event was the backdrop of its writing doeg was his name 
So in this psalm, David imparts invaluable lessons that we come face to face with tonight and, and, and what we are to do when we face evil around us as we live in our world, as we live in our country. Uh, I guess the news lately is filled with open hatred against Christians in America and, and all over the world. Uh, we heard today uh, uh, the Congress is having a hearing on uh, the FBI going into churches uh, for political reasons. If you, I don't know if you saw any of that today. But according to a great magazine, it's called Christianity Today, every day 13 Christians worldwide are killed because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every day, 12 Christians are unjustly arrested and imprisoned, and every day, five Christians are abducted because of their faith in Christ. Many countries have very high or extremely high levels of persecution against Christians, and we can see it uh, coming our way every day in America. I told you 20 years ago it was coming, and uh, we, we're seeing it more and more, and they don't seem to be too uh, ashamed, or they're not trying to hide it anymore. But we need to prepare ourselves, and we need to prepare our families uh, to endure this hatred uh, uh, in, in a biblical fashion. How do we react when we are persecuted, maybe at work, or maybe they come in one day and arrest me and take me off to prison? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Some of the things I say, I, I, you know, I, I'm a no-nonsense guy, and, and uh, we put the word out there. And we let people know the truth. Uh, and, and, but we must stand firm on God's Word. The Bible says we are to contend for the faith. But we, almost, we also should patiently endure the hostility of the proud as we live the Christian life. The psalm begins by directing uh, us to the proud. It addresses the proud right off the bat. Uh, yet because it is written for the righteous, we should understand that this chapter that we come to tonight is informing us of what we are to expect while the Word of God challenges the proud in their own wickedness. The psalm recounts for us David's divinely inspired response to the one of the, of the darkest events probably in his life that he ever experienced. And that's when all these priests were killed. And, and let me tell you, you know, when we studied the life of David, that he experienced many dark days, did he not? And some of it he brought on himself, of course. But this is one of the worst, probably, days as all 85 of these priests are killed and, and one escapes. But David assures us in this passage that justice would be done by God. God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord, to the wicked. God's going to take care of business uh, one day, and sometime even in this life. And so every Christian in the face of injustice in our fallen world may draw lessons from this psalm in regards to how we ought to respond, and, and that is waiting in trust in the God of loving kindness who will not forget to fulfill his covenant promises that he has made to us. Uh, let's look at this together tonight and see what God has for us. First of all, we see the boasting tongue of the godless. It's, a, it's really about the tongue. It says, verse 1, let's go ahead and read the first four verses. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? So uh, David is addressing Doeg. The goodness of God endureth continually. Thy tongue deviseth mischief like a sharp razor, working deceitfully. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness. Selah, meditate on this. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue, it says. So, you know, the tongue is one of the smallest members 
of the body. It's one of the smallest parts of the body. But let me tell you something. It can do the most damage. You know that. The Bible teaches us that in the book of James. So in these verses, David writes about an experience then that he had with the evil man, an Edomite named Doeg, who had a wicked, boastful tongue. And David cautions us about different kinds of damaging tongues, I notice in this passage. First of all, beware of a boastful tongue. Uh, we see that in, in verse 1. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, almighty man? So Doeg was a proud man. He was a military man in the army of, of King Saul. And in his boastful pride, he told Saul about David, and it cost many lives of the priest. And so we like to boast because maybe it inflates maybe our ego. Uh, uh, but those who boast, you know who we really should boast in? We should boast in the Lord. Uh, th that's who we should boast in. If we boast in the Lord, we will bring him glory. We glorify him. And we are to do all that we do to the glory of God. Secondly, not only a boastful tongue, but it mentions in verse 2 a sharp tongue. It says in verse 2, Thy tongue deviseth mischief like a sharp razor working deceitfully. So Doeg had a boastful tongue, verse 1, but he had a sharp tongue, verse 2. I noticed on down in verse 3 he had a lying tongue. Ah. Uh, it really bothers us when people lie on us, doesn't it? And then down in verse 4, uh, it says that he had a deceitful tongue. He was a deceiver. So uh, it says, you love evil more than good and lie in rather than speak in righteousness. It says that in verse 3. But uh, notice verse 2. Thy tongue deviseth mischief like a sharp razor working deceitfulness. So have you ever... Um, had someone to use a sharp tongue on you. I mean, it cut to the bone. Uh, the question is, uh, have you ever cut someone with your tongue, too? Uh, what really hurts is when we cut someone with lies. And we see that in this, these verses. Lying is a terrible sin. And Satan is a liar, and he is a murderer. And he wants to use our tongues, he wants us to, to spread the seed. He doesn't want us to spread the gospel. He doesn't want us to spread righteousness. So in verse 1, David magnifies, I notice though, we can't leave that out. He magnifies the goodness of God in 1B. Um, when we boast of the goodness of God, our tongues are medicine to heal. Uh, not sharp razors that cut and hurt, but they, our tongue is a medicine. Our tongues are used to speak righteousness, not to spread lies. They will boast about the Lord, not about ourselves. Uh, let's yield our hearts to God so that our tongues might be used for blessing. So David is stunned. I, I can sense this in the scripture in verse 1, that a man would boast about evil things as if they were great acts. I mean, uh, in verse 1. I mean, it says, Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, evil? Why, why would you boast about that? Uh, why would a person uh, possibly do such a thing when, God, when God's covenant uh, loyalty exists? How crazy is that for Doeg to do that? And in verse 3, you love evil, more than good, it says in verse 3, evil people love evil things. And uh, their values are completely distorted. The proud, evil person may not commit all the evil personally, but he certainly loves it when evil things happen. He's right there maybe cheering it on and saying, hey, great job. He, he continues to tell stories about evil uh, events long after the fact are the, the facts of it. Does this sound like a statement taken directly from the current news sometimes? I mean, people praise the taking of a baby's life 
through abortion. I mean, they stand on the TV in front of a camera and act like it's some kind of glorious thing to take the life of a, a, a baby in the womb. I mean, that's the most dangerous place you can be in America now. What is it, 65, 66 million babies have been aborted in this country since Roe versus Wade? Thank God that at least the Supreme Court has overturned it, but it went, all it did is went back to the states. There's still babies are dying every day in the womb, and, and some seem to want to, uh, they've lost respect for the sanctity of life. They want to kill them on the table even outside the womb. And so we find that uh, people repeat store after story of vandalism. We hear of people uh, going in stores and robbing people and their stores closing in our larger cities because uh, they're being robbed blind. And the police, uh, they, they are defunded in those cities so they can't come and help them and, and people are beaten and, and all repeated with words of praise for progress. If that's progress, we don't need it, my friends. We need to remember that as Christians, we ought to be opposed to all forms of abuse and oppression, but we must also be opposed to all forms of anarchy and rebellion against the laws of the land. And so it is the sign of the proud and wicked that rebels against God that any of these evil deeds would be praised at all. And, and Christians, uh, are you assessing the events? Don't, don't hide your head in the sand. You need to know what's going on in this nation. You need to watch the uh, nightly news and assess what's going on in our world in light of the Holy Scriptures. You need to do that. And fathers, are, are you taking the time to teach your children to assess the events of their lives through the lens of Scripture. What does God say about this? And so the proud, they love evil events, and they love perverted lifestyles, and they love anti-God rhetoric, and they hate the Bible now. There are people that hate God, hate the Bible, and in, in the very first four verses here, we see the loves of the proud and the boastful. We see their lion tongues. We see their boastful and sharp tongues. The, the proud love cutting deception and evil events. They love it. And neither of these should come as a surprise to any of us as believers, though. I mean, rather, we, we must patiently endure the hostility of the proud as we live a life of faith by the Holy Scriptures. Also, we find a second part, and that is the boast of the godly. So it goes in the first verses, the first four, the boast of the ungodly, and now we come to the boast of the godly uh, in verses 5 through 9. God will judge the wicked, folks. That is a given. If you believe the Word of God, you have to believe that. Uh, we do not know when. We do not know uh, when it's coming. Uh, but we know it's coming. Uh, in, in fact, from, from the New Testament, we know that it will come in the form of the returning Christ. Jesus Christ will come for a second time. He came the first time as a servant to serve and to die for us and, and to seek and to save that which was lost. He will come the next time to rule and to reign. He's not going to be uh, a servant. He's coming to rule in the reign, and he's going to reign in glory and power, and he's going to make his enemy his footstool, and he's going to rule with a rod of iron, the Bible says. He will come as the conquering judge, the word indicates. So in Psalm 52, we're reminded that when God's judgment comes, both the proud and the righteous will be impacted. Also, we see the contrast between the godly and the ungodly. There's a contrast here in these verses. First of all, the proud, proud man will fall. Look at verse 5 with me. So David's speaking about Doeg, and he says in verse 5, 
God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away. He shall pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. Notice the words that David uses. He's, David uses the verbs plucked up, snatched up, tear away, uproot. You see that? That's what he's talking about. These, these are words that create pictures that describe the suddenness of God's judgment on the ungodly. It, it's swift. And, and these words might cause us to think of something like maybe a massive tree, maybe a uh, hurricane remnants go through our area and maybe we go around and look at some of the fallen trees and some of the trees don't have very deep roots you know and it, sometimes it can be massive trees uh, and uh, uh, they're suddenly just torn out of the ground uh, as, as it topples maybe in a storm or, or maybe a roof that is suddenly snatched off a house by a tornado that passes over that house and so the idea is that the boastful, proud, they're going to be going along. They're going to think they've got it made through life, thinking that uh, maybe he is the master uh, of his own universe, thinking that he's in charge and control when suddenly God's judgment will strike. Notice the wicked man is still being addressed directly here in verse 5. When God's judgment strikes, there will be no recovery. There will be no second chance. There will be, uh, it will be forever. It will be permanent. One of the problems with humanistic philosophy is that it causes people to think that they are self-sufficient. Uh, in our public schools, and not, maybe not all of them, but many of them in, in some states for sure, they really teach humanism. And, and uh, they teach that you can be self-sufficient, you be all, you can be, it's all about you. And of course, God is totally excluded. What we teach here, and according to the scriptures, be all God wants you to be. God has a purpose, he has a plan for your life, and you be what God has called you to be. He has called you on purpose, according to his purpose, and he has a purpose for you. So they think they don't need maybe any outside help, uh, and that uh, in and of themselves, they have all they need for life and even for death. And David describes this kind of person in verse 7. Listen to what he says in verse 7. Here's the man, he says, who did not make God his strength, but in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. So where did he get, try to get his strength from? From his wealth uh, and also from his wicked schemes, his wickedness. And so that's a description of the self-sufficient person who doesn't know how dangerous his situation really is. Notice that God was not his strength. He trusted in his own riches and his own wickedness. He was strengthened in his sin. He was doing it his way. And, you know, I saw on the news this morning, I, I don't know if you, you uh, saw it, but 16 houses in an affluent gated community in Southern California have slid off of a hilltop down into a canyon, and they expect more of these beautiful homes uh, to do the same thing as the foundation of those homes give away. And they said the water bills had been very high. Maybe there was water, leaking pipes. I don't know what it, what it is, but apparently the foundation wasn't very strong. And these are sliding into the canyon. And so when life is built on sin, uh, the point is it has no foundation. And that is the ungodly man. You remember the parable that Jesus told? It's just a simple parable that we teach to our kids about the two men who built houses and it's found in Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 27 and the foolish man built his house upon the sand he, he did not think he needed God he did not obey God he didn't think he needed Christ uh, the wise man built his house upon the rock and he obeyed God and when the storms came the house that was built upon the rock the Bible says remained strong and the house that was built upon the sand collapsed. 
God was not this self-sufficient person's strength in this chapter. And, and God was not his confidence. He depended on his wealth. I'll tell you, when you come to the end of the way, I don't care how much money you have, how many stocks you have, how, much, how many cars you have, how much savings you have, you're going to leave it all. And the only thing you're going to take with you is what you have done for Jesus. And even that, your motives have to be right. Most people today think that money can solve every problem. It's just like $2 billion was given to our educational system in America during COVID, and they don't even know where it is. But they've tried to throw money at problems for many years, and, and things are not getting better. They're getting worse. And so the person in verse 7 trusted in the abundance of his riches. And what happened to him? God shall likewise, it says, destroy you forever. He shall take you away. He shall pluck you out of your dwelling place and uproot you from the land of the living, it says in verse 5. He's going to uproot you. I, I, I read about this man, uh, and, and it's not funny. I, oh, it, I hope he was ready to go. But uh, he was sleeping in his bed, and a 12 by 12 hole formed under his bedroom, and, it, and the house floor gave way, and he fell into this uh, hole, and they were not able to retrieve him. And the hole keeps opening up. They filled it up about three times, I think, and it's opened up again. But can you imagine leaving this life this way suddenly? And, that, and that's what we see here in this chapter. All of a sudden, it, I mean, you, you leave the church, you think everything's okay, you go out here at the intersection and, and maybe you, your life is snuffed out suddenly. I remember one night sitting at the stoplight out here and all of a sudden this car came by, I believe it was a, a Camaro, maybe a Corvette, and it was going like 120. It was up there at the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the brick overpass, uh, not bricks, a concrete overpass in seconds, and a state trooper right behind him. And I thought if, if, I, I, if it had been three seconds later, uh, you know, I, I could have been out there, and it was no way I could have gotten out of the guy's way as fast as they were going. I would have been, we never know. I, we need to be ready to go. But we, we find that we can see this person in his home, this rich man that's trusting in himself, surrounded by his wealth, and God just reaches in and plucks him out. Maybe the way you would reach into a rabbit hole and pull out a rabbit. I've never, I've, I have been rabbit hunting, but I've never pulled one out of a hole, but God can certainly do that with us. Uh, there, it, it, uh, this person is like a, a tree. God says, I'm going to uproot you. Uh, the righteous will get the last laugh in verse 6. The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, verse 6. Are you, are you going to be a part of the last laugh? Or is someone going to be laughing at you? That's the question. God is your strength. God is your confidence. Don't be like the self-sufficient person who trusts in the world's substitutes for strength and for confidence. Let the Word of God permeate your mind. Hide its truth in your heart that you might not sin against God. Place yourself in God's care and let him establish you. And be like that tree in Psalm 1 that's planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season and the leaf shall not wither and whatsoever you do it shall prosper. Psalm 1 verse 4. The proud and boastful will be torn down. And that is what will come to the proud when the judgment of God arrives. You know, friends, the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. You know, we hear the love of God, the love of God, the love of God, and there's, uh, the love of God's wonderful. 
And I preach about the love of God, but we never hear anything about the wrath of God. But when you study verse by verse, you have to deal with the wrath too. And did you know there's probably more in the Bible about the wrath of God than the love of God? Even the righteous, as we see in the first line of verse 6, will initially, even the righteous will respond, it says, in fear when they see the suddenness of God's judgment on the wicked. God's judgment will be terrifying. It's no joke. But then the righteous will realize that God has judged the wicked so that they will finally experience relief from all the oppression that they have endured because of the wicked. Look at what Doeg did to David and to all those priests. When the, that realization comes, that terror that they have by the suddenness of the wrath of God will turn to joy. God's judgment will ultimately bring laughter. It will bring spontaneous joy because justice has broken through and has won out in the end. If you can remember back in grade school, can you remember back that far? <laughs> well, if you can remember back in grade school, maybe you, you had studied hard for an exam. You had burned the midnight oil, and, and you look over and when the exam is given, and you look over and you see one of your classmates using cheat notes and you think to yourself they're going to get a better grade I I've studied hard and I might not get but a B but they might get an A plus and they haven't studied at all did that does that did that ever bother you and, and then all of a sudden the teacher walks over and the person is busted and is taken to the office and it makes you feel good it makes you feel good that the cheater was caught and you had studied hard uh, to a much greater degree we will be filled with joy when we see the the cosmic justice by our righteous God to those who have been wicked and have rebelled against God his justice will draw praise from our lips and maybe even joy and laughter from our hearts at the same time the reality that this day is coming is intended to reinforce our minds that it is not worth going against our Lord. It, it's stupidity to go against God. The wicked will not escape. The proud will not win. Whatever we are enduring at this moment is only temporary, even if we're being persecuted by the wicked. We will enjoy the relief that comes when justice is served. The judgment of God is coming, and when it, it does, the proud will be torn down, and the righteous will rejoice with relief. In contrast to the ungodly man, the righteous man will flourish, it says in verse 8. Notice his consecration, the consecration of this man. He says, but I am, this is me. Look at verse 8. Of chapter 52 it says but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God now 90% of your people might read that and say what in the world is he talking about I am like a green olive tree in the house of God I trust in the mercy of God forever and I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it and so David says but I am do you see that in verse 8 I am David contrasts the life that he is determined to live by the help and grace of God against the wicked, proud, boastful, lying man that he has been addressing in this psalm. David is committed to living a life of faith, to living by the Pentateuch, to living by the Word, to living as, as a righteous man in light of the judgment and that was to come. And so in these verses, there are two elements of, of the life of faith that are contrasted with the wicked man that I want you to see. The first one is David will offer thanksgiving to God. Verse 8, he says, But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever, and I what? I will praise thee 
forever because thou hast done it. So we find in contrast to the wicked whom God will uproot, the righteous man, it says, will be like a green olive tree. Now what, do you know anything about olive trees? I know quite a bit about them. The green olive tree was known for its longevity. It was known for its usefulness. An olive tree may last for hundreds of years. Did you know that? Hundreds of years and produce olives which are used for many beneficial purposes. David's going to be like an olive tree. When Geneva and I visited Israel, they took us to the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and that is right at the foot. The Garden of Gethsemane is right at the foot of the Mount of Olives. Why do you think it's called the Mount of Olives? It has olive trees, a lot of olive trees on it. And, and they told us that studies have been done, and some of those olive trees are over 900 years old. Think about the storms. Think about the uh, barren droughts. Think about the snowy, freezing, icy weather. And they have that about every year over there. And, and, and those trees, think about what they have endured over a period of 900 years, because some of them are very old in the garden. And the righteous man is like a green olive tree. If you compare yourself to something in nature, I wonder what you would choose. Would it be a flying star? Oh, oh, uh, would, would you say you're like a mountain? Would you say you're like a hill? Would you say you're like a lake? What would you use in nature? David wrote in verse 8, I'm like an olive tree, a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. David compared himself to something permanent in, in contrast to the wicked who will be uprooted suddenly in the land of the living, verse 5. Contrasting the two. So what I want us to notice, though, is where David places the olive tree. It is in the house of God. David said he uses the olive tree, nature, and he, and he places it in the house of God. In other words, the reason that the tree is secure because it is dwelling in a sacred and secure place. The key idea that we need to take away from this comparison is that the secret to standing strong in the faith is to remain close to God through the means that he has provided by taking in the word of God, by the regular worship of God. Amen. For David, that was the tabernacle. And for us, it, it, it's the, no, we're the ecclesia, we're the church, but it, it is the place of worship. For David, it was, back then, it was called the house of God because at that point we were, had not been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Now we, we are the house of God, but it, it, the emphasis is on corporate worship. We need to be present in the church to learn more about the Word of God. We need to be present in the church to connect with God's people. We need to be present in the church that we may bear one another's burdens. We need to be present in the church anticipating that God will work through the Word of God by the Holy Spirit in our lives when we come. We need to be present in the place of worship because our kids need it. Further, Father is the most valuable thing you can do to prepare your children to endure the hostility of this world is teach them the importance of two things. One is the Word of God and the other is corporate worship. You know, in a lot of churches, they're not getting the Word of God. And, and I, I mean, I met with a young family last night and uh, they're going to join in a few weeks. And uh, they're, they're excited about the Lord and the church. But this, the husband was in a church for years. He had learned more in just a few months at Faith Memorial than all of those years in that other church. He hadn't learned anything. And I hear that all the time. And I, and I say that humbly. But why aren't preachers preaching the word from their pulpits? I wouldn't stay in a church that didn't preach the Word of God five minutes. It's a waste of time. So the righteous stand strong in faith 
because they are planted in the house of God where they hear the word of God and sing the praises of God, verse 8. So David refers to this worship when he says, I will praise thee forever because of what thou, because thou hast done it, is the way it's written in verse 8. You don't take care of the wicked. You will take care of the wicked and the ungodly uh, one day in your judgment, and you take care of me. One last thought, David will confidently wait on God. And that's a hard thing, isn't it? That's the hardest thing for us to do. Look at 9b, and I will wait on thy name, for it is good before thy saints. See, this life is hard. And the righteous is determined to wait on God with confidence. The righteous, like David, will make a conscious decision to trust in God's providence and in his love and kindness. The righteous will wait on God's name. What does God's name mean here in the Hebrew? It means his character. He is perfection. And rather than the righteous man trusting in his wealth like the wicked, rather than waiting on his own ability, the righteous person waits upon God with unshakable confidence because he or she knows God is righteous in his character and holy. Are you waiting with confidence in God about something in your life? Maybe you've been going through it quite a while and you say, Lord, when are you going to take care of this mess? Uh, Walking with confidence means trusting God even when you cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel. All you may be able to see is that the world is crashing in on top of you and around you. All you may be able to see is that the ungodly in our world seem to be winning. And we seem to be losing the culture war. Uh, we're g- getting away from the principles this nation was built upon. All you may be able to see is that the easy way out of your problems seems to be the path of the wicked. Maybe you're thinking that. So when that is all you can see, have you determined to still wait upon God with confidence? That is the decision that a righteous man or woman will make. The righteous will wait with confidence. So we've seen in this psalm this evening that the proud love cutting deception They love evil events. Uh, We have also been reminded that the judgment of God will come, and when it does, the proud, the wicked, the evil ones will be torn down while the righteous will rejoice with relief. And this is meant to motivate us to stand strong in our Christian lives, to stand for Christ, to stand up for Jesus, a life characterized by the righteous standing strong in the faith and waiting in in confidence for God to work. We are surrounded by wickedness, by uh, proud people, hostile to God and his word in every way. I know that. Such will bring constant storms into our lives as Christians. We need to have deep roots if, if we're going to stand rooted and develop through a regular intake of the Word of God, a regular and consistent life of worship, and a life of living by faith. Well, that's our study for tonight. That's all I can get out of the nine verses. At least tonight, I might can go back and get some more out of it for next week, but I don't think I'm going to do that. We're going to keep moving on because we don't want to be too exhaustive. We do have a business meeting, so...